A good girl. Hold. Here we go. Hold. Hold. <laughs> All right, this is the one. Hold. Good girl. Good girl. All right, let's go. <laughs> I'm Eric Baker, and I've lived in Tennessee my entire life. However, for the last decade touring the world, I've only seen it passing by from a windshield. But finally, Tennessee is calling me back where I belong. There's a place you've never been. It's right where you want to be. I want to rediscover how great my home state is, and I want you to come with me. Unshot. On this episode of Tennessee Uncharted, I'm headed into the foothills of the Smoky Mountains to meet up with some of the folks who are leading the charge to volunteer and bring back one of Tennessee's most noteworthy native birds, the bobwhite quail. I actually have a very close connection to the bobwhite quail. My dad is one of the best whistlers I've ever heard. And when I was a kid, for the longest time, all I wanted was to be able to whistle like my dad. Well, one day, he finally taught me how to whistle and he started by teaching me a simple song with three notes that sounds like this. This is the song of the bobwhite quail. Now I've learned hundreds of songs since then, but there are a few that mean more to me than the melody of those three simple notes. Once upon a time as a resident of Tennessee, you would have been very familiar with the song of the bobwhite quail. For many years, it played as part of the soundtrack to every afternoon spent outside. But sadly, beginning in the 1950s and 60s, population growth and urban sprawl began to rob these fellow Tennesseans of the habitat that they call home. By the 1990s, some regions in Tennessee had seen population declines of up to 90%. Luckily, however, we're not a state known for standing idly by. And thanks to conservation groups like the Smoky Mountain Chapter of Quail Forever, a lot is now being done to make a difference for quail. The population of quail have declined over the last several decades here in East Tennessee. As a matter of fact, they've declined in all of the states, uh, so it's a big problem uh, for uh, passing on of the uh, tradition of quail hunting and listening to the song of the bobwhite, which many of us uh, hardly ever hear anymore. Right, in, in East Tennessee is up to 90% of the population is, it is, 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 is declined. It, there's hardly any left anywhere. You seldom ever hear them anymore. What are some of the things that quail forever does to uh, to help. Our, our mission really is to improve habitat for wildlife, particularly for bobwhite quail. We have uh, uh, lots of equipment which we use to plant uh, food plots, nesting cover, and improve habitat in, in many ways. Plus, we, we try to be sure that we are able to reintroduce birds in locations that have good habitat. Mm -hmm. Some say that nothing lasts forever. Some say that all good things must come to an end. Well, the people of Quail Forever are working very hard to prove those people wrong. So tell me what we, we have a, a surrogator here, right? And this is part of the process of reintroducing quail, right? This is one technical uh, method by which we can reintroduce uh, quail into, a, into an area. And you put this surrogator into the field, stock it with about 130 birds, one day old birds, and they're left there for five to nine weeks. They, we have to make sure that the temperatures don't go below 55 degrees. So we have a heater in here. They have food and water, and they're let, they're let grow in their natural habitat. For, uh, for those five to nine weeks. Then they're released. So it's kind of a, a newborn resort for quail, it, that's in a way. A very good description. <laughs> keeps them warm, keeps them fed, keeps water. Keeps them happy. Sounds awesome. I need a surrogator yeah, for, I, for this I, guy. Where's yeah, my surrogator? I could go along with that, too. <laughs> that's right. We would thrive. Well, absolutely. That's right. 
Well, we've been talking about uh, releasing these birds into the wild. Would you like to help me release this set of birds? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, let's give it a try. Come to me. Oh! Oh, they're ready to go. Okay. Are we ready to release? Let's do it. Let's put this. Whoa. Come on. Come on. There we go. That's All awesome. Set. Yes. So these are ready for their first day in the wild out of their resort. Amazing. We're uh, continuing the Bob White song. It's going to be a little bit louder tonight. Uh, definitely. They'll be several times louder. While breeding and raising future populations of quail is a critical component to revitalizing the population overall, all that work would be for naught if we weren't taking steps to ensure future homes for these feathered friends. So today I've made my way to Kiker Bottoms to learn more about the reintroduction of habitat for the bobwhite quail. While Kiker Bottoms is primarily considered a fowl area, maintaining the proper balance through conservation and preservation is still key. Without the daily efforts of groups like the Smoky Mountain Chapter of Quail Forever and the Conservation Corps of AmeriCorps Knoxville, this balance would not be possible. All right, so uh, we're here in one of the fields at Kiker Bottom, and I know y'all have done a lot of work out here. What exactly am I looking at? What am I seeing? Okay, this is one of the areas that Quail Forever helps on. This is a, a log land, so we thin the forest okay. to make more, so more vegetation can grow up through the trees and that's way better for quail habitat. And quail forever on this logging road and on up here for log landing. And this uh, log landing and this road bed is a combination of, of wild plants and some uh, plants that we plant from okay. seed. We depend on people that want to volunteer. We have right. you know, quail forever, we got AmeriCorps, we have all these people that want to come out and they feel like they're a part of it. And they mm -hmm. are a part of it mm -hmm. and that's so important to be out here and you're seeing, you know, your sweat is actually producing something. Totally. Uh, we as Quail Forever want to especially pitch in and help him in any way that we can. And it's it's a plus plus all the way around for us, you know. So the, the, the structure that we put in, like Bill said, and the wild stuff, if we come in early and do that to help him get this, then we don't have the erosion, we get a, a jump on things and all, the quail gets a habitat real fast. Other all other species benefit from it. So it's a win-win, and, and, and we're all supportive of the bill's efforts and everything and all, and we're happy to be able to do this. This is some native grasses. This is a big blue stem. Okay. And you see the way it grows. It grows in a clump, so that there's soil exposed all the way around this, and that's what quail have to have that exposed soil around the clump of a plant. Gotcha. So that's why this is the, the native grasses are so much more important than the ones we were describing earlier with fescue that makes a gnat that grows over the whole. All right. So Bill, this back here looks a little different than what we've been seeing. What what is this that we're looking at? This was all closed canopy forest. Okay. As of this this past summer. So that's that's one growing season that we're looking at. And you can see uh, before it was just a solid forest of trees and no no vegetation under it. So you can look out there now and see that there's plenty of cover and food and, and I've seen quail there already. They're already coming into this area where there's been a closed canopy forest. They, they wouldn't use that habitat. Right. So the species that we left are going to produce mass and then we open that up to stimulate all the, the plant growth under it. And all that's just waiting in the ground ready It's to... right there. We didn't, all that that you're looking at, none of it's planted. I'm, I'm fired up, so I'm ready to get my hands dirty. And one of the things that we're going to do today is, is try to get rid of some exotics. So, okay. So we'll be doing some tree injecting. We'll do some clipping and spraying of, of some exotic plants that, were, that are on the area. And that's a never-ending job. So all right. We'll make well, sure that we can get you on that. Let's get to it. John, you are with CAC AmeriCorps, correct? That's right. We do environmental service work here in East Tennessee. We've been doing it for 20 years. More recently, we've had our Conservation Corps, which is a smaller team of our AmeriCorps program, work with um, 
Bill Smith and with TWRA here at Cocker Bottom. Why is a program like this important? It's important for a couple of reasons. It gives uh, young people a chance to be, able, be out in nature, learn new skills. They're learning things from Bill and from TWR they would never get anywhere else. Um, in addition to that, we're helping the environment. And um, it doesn't matter where we're doing the work that we do, we're helping the entire ecosystem here. And that's truly one of the most important things for us here in East Tennessee. What do you say we go give them a hand and uh, try and make a difference today? That's right. That's, that's right. it. Go get All right, dirty. Let's do it. These are weed wrenches. Uh, a lot of plants are hard to pull up with your bare hands if you get your grip on this. Okay. You pull like that, you get good leverage and you can pull them up right by the root. Right. A lot of plants, if you don't get them by the root, will uh, come right back up on you. Okay. So these are good to get to the root of the problem. What you do is you uh, get this around, get it to bite on something. Okay. And you pull up on it. You gotta put your Really get your, really get there your you butter go. in there. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That is. Let's see. It's coming up. There it goes. Oh yeah. I did that single-handedly. <laughs> Come down. Are we injecting in this again? Uh, just an herbicide. And this is a way to focus the... Injecting it only into that single stem and not so you wouldn't yep. herbicide things that you might want to leave. It never ceases to amaze me how much giving back takes out of you. That being said though, I think it's all been well worth it because tomorrow I've got my sights set on enjoying the fruits of my labor. At least that's what I'm aiming for. I'm definitely of the opinion that a day spent outside is always better than, well, pretty much anything. But I'd still like to fare as well as I can on our quail hunt tomorrow. So I've stopped by the Chill Howie Sportsman's Club to freshen up on my foul play and to sharpen my shooting skills. Oh. I have never shot sporting clays before. All right. So um, let's just start at the basics. What's the difference between sporting clays and skeet? Well, skeet, you have a high house and a low house, and the targets are crossing you all the time, and you're going around a semicircle, so they have the same pattern all the time. And once you figure out your lead, you should be able to hit them pretty easily. And sporting Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly, okay. Right. In sporting clays, like today, we have 15 stations set up. Okay. And every station has a different presentation to it. Okay. It changes all the time. Okay. I mean, we set the course up for a tournament that we're going to have tomorrow, and next week it'll probably be different than what it is today. And that's what makes it so interesting and so hard. More challenging. More challenging. Okay. Much more challenging. We uh, are going to do some quail hunting. Okay. And, yeah, it's good practice. Quail. It is. It's good practice for that. We have a lot of guys when dove season starts, guys will show up and just want to tone their skills a little bit, shooting right. sporting clays, but they'll find that shooting sporting clays is harder than shooting a dove sometimes. Right, you right. Know, or quail or anything else. It's really a very challenging sport. If you hit the target, you say dead bird, you put an X down. If you miss it, you say lost bird, you put oh. a zero. Okay. So we want to keep your score, one lost and one dead. All right. Yeah. You want to shoot again? Yes. Yeah. All right, ah. a little bit behind it. Dead. Dead. Woo! Pull. Dead. 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 
fifth pair. Really? Yeah, you got yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't see the first one. Well, you have to see, that's the thing about sporting clays. You can get little chips off these targets. You have to really focus on them. Pull. Dead. Pull. Just pull. Dead. Dead. Lord of mercy, Eric. Sorry. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, look at that TV land. I'm a shooting ace. <laughs> ah. Good shot on that. Woo, that one felt good. Yeah. I shot behind that first yes, one. Yes, you did, yeah. You got to keep your gun. Moving. That's right. I stopped You it. pull, what you do, what happens is you pull the trigger and stop your gun. It's kind of like a golf swing. Yep. You have to swing all the way through. through. Yeah. Pull. Dead, boss. All right, you got it. You got it. Yes! <laughs> As my dad would say, anything worth doing is worth doing well. So I've met back up with some of the folks of Smoky Mountain Quail Forever to put my skills to the test and find out why this sport is worth preserving. Mike, how you doing, brother? Fine. Good I'm to see you again. Good to see you. Come I've been looking forward to today. I am ready to do some hunting. Are so you ready to shoot some quail? I huh? shoot at them, I no, guess. Is no, right? we, <laughs> we've got some fine pointing dogs and plenty of quail to practice on and all, so we'll give you several opportunities. All right, yeah, all right, so, all right. Kelly. Hop on down. Good boy. He's yep. ready to he's, go. He's all, oh, he's ready to go. At first, I felt very conflicted at the thought of hunting the same birds that we've been working all week to preserve. But what I quickly learned is that without hunters, there wouldn't even be a preservation effort to save the quail. There is a deep history and heritage of quail hunting in the South, and it's about much more than just killing birds. My dad grew up quail hunting and many of his best stories are told with quail hunting as the backdrop. What scares me is that without Bob White quail, a lot of great stories will never be told for future generations. First one. Very good. First one. Congratulations, I'm super you made a real good shot. So yeah. is this a, a boy or a girl? This what do we got is, here? This is a rooster, what we call rooster. Okay. The, the white on his head here, the hens will have tan on them where these are white. They'll also, they, they all have the black streak there in them, but uh, that's how you distinguish them apart. And it, that's exciting, man. Right, right. Killer did it's, a great job. Well, that's that's the pretty part about quail hunting. It's, there's several excitements. You get to watch the dog, get to watch the dog point, walk up to him, the birds come up, and there's, I've hunted about everything. There's nothing like a rush like a, yeah, well, I mean, they pop, up. popping up there, yep. yeah, because, yep. I mean, just the sound of right. it and everything, it's yeah, startling it's, it's, in a good way, you right, know what I mean? Right. You have to participate in a sport before you really understand, you know, the benefits and everything out of it. So we're really encouraged to bring the youth in to let them know what actually happened. And they will help us, you know, in the long run, get more birds and uh, understand more about them. And it's some of the older generation that actually is trying to keep this going just because the younger generation, they just hadn't had the opportunity to know about this. Absolutely. So that's why we're trying to reintroduce it and to be a help, you know, even to the quail and I'll get more support and, I'll, and then introduce them to a sport that they would probably truly love because it's real camaraderie with your dog and, you know, getting out in the, in the environment and everything and all and enjoying the outdoors. So it's a win-win all the way around, but it's not all, ever been about killing birds. It's about the enjoyment part and, and bringing other people in to understand, you know, and, and help the bird. Number three right there, if you're counting at home. One of the most important things you can have on a quail hunt is a good dog. In fact, without the dogs we had along with us today, our quest for the rather elusive quail would have been almost certainly unsuccessful. So I caught up with Ed Ford over at Thunder King Kennels to learn more on what it takes to have these pups pointing at their prime. When you're training a good dog, is it, is it more the, 
the, the nature and the genetics or is it the, the nurture and the training that, that, that really it, makes that, that both, good dog? Both of us got to bind together. If it don't bind, it don't click. Uh, training bird dogs is a slow process. Me personally, I like to start with them about six months and okay. getting them out and just let them run in the field and let them, enjoy, let them be puppies. And so I start them just chasing butterflies or if I there ain't nothing out in the field and we put some birds in the field for them to chase. My own personal dogs, I will force break them to retrieve first. You don't want to shoot a bird and they pick it up and run all over the field, the woods, whatever, for forever how long they run run with it. Right, uh, right. So I want them to be able to shoot it and they bring it back to me and hopefully put it in my hand. You guys look like so much fun. They, they look hungry. They look hungry. They are hungry. Hey, pups. What are you feeding them? We are feeding today black gold dog food, premium dog food. Okay. Well, these guys like it. They do like it. Hi there, how are you? <laughs> oh man, they're cute. <laughs> Looks like you've done a great job. You keep doing this, I'll put you on full time. <laughs> All right, so what's next? Well, let's get moving to the force breaking. Now, what is force breaking mean exactly? Okay, when you're out in, in, in the field actually hunting and you dog points a bird, you want to walk up and shoot the bird. And when it falls, you want the dog to go get it and pick it up and bring it back to you. Okay. And it won't do that naturally. So, so where do we that, where do we start? Well, we got this wooden dowel, and we hopefully going to teach this dog to hold it in its mouth and walk up down this cable with it down in its mouth today. Okay. Uh, we don't know how good that's going to rope, but that's the plan. Tell it to hold. Hold. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Hold here. 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 Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Yes. Yes. Here we go. Here we go. Hold. Here we go. Hold. There we go. Good girl. Yeah. Hold. 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 Oh, that's all right. Here we go. Let me show you how it's done. Let me show you how it's done. Hey, hold. 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 Who knows where that's been, right? First thing I'm going to do is give my wife a kiss when I get home. Hold. That's a good girl. Hold. Can you hold? Can you hold it? It's delicious. I just tried it. It's bacon flavored. Good girl. Good hold. Hold. Oh. She's ready. I can see it in her eyes. You ready? Hold. <laughs> Here we go. Open up. Hold. Good girl. Good hold. Yeah, good girl. Hold. <laughs> Here we go, sweet pea. Open up. Hold, good girl. Yeah, all right, come on. Good hold, good girl. You wanna walk with me? Come on. Hold. Oh. <laughs> Don't fire me, Ed. Don't, Don't fire, fire me. You. Well, you took a kennel hand to fire you. Yeah, you, you <laughs> that's right. I'll stick to spraying the, the poop. Good girl. Out, out. Good girl, good girl, come on. Good girl, good girl. There you oh. go. Oh, good girl, good girl. Uh, yeah. Yay, good all right. Girl. Awesome. Good girl. Good job. Ed, who do we have here? We've got Ace. Ace? So, so now we're, we're going to see turn him, uh, turn him the, loose and see, hopefully see what a finished product. The, the, the end product. Yes, okay. sir. All right. After spending some time with Ed Ford at his kennel, I've decided that my golden retriever, Lily, must be hard of hearing because I have never seen dogs listen so well. Man, look at him. He thinks he's wanting a bird. All right. We're going to go in front of him and kick and, and, and flush, and hopefully there's going to be a bird. What do you want me to do, Ed? Just stand there, and hopefully there's a bird here. I All hope right. so. Well, we ain't going to be able to. Let's go. Right there.
Later, North. One of the things I love most about a song is its power to take you back in time. If you listen close, a song can truly be a time machine. Every time I hear the song of the Bob White Quail, I think of my dad and smile as I'm immediately transported back to the carefree days of my youth when I was first learning to whistle. A song with three simple notes that echo deep into Southern history, heritage, and tradition. A song with three simple notes that mean my dad is never too far away. A song with three simple notes that if silenced will mean so much more than just the loss of a bird with a beautiful song. <laughs>